This episode is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, a community of homebrewers dedicated to the art, science, and appreciation of great beer. The AHA invites new and renewing members to choose a free brewing book with their membership, Brewing Eclectic IPA by Dick Cantwell, or Designing Great Beers by Ray Daniels. Join or renew with the code IPA or designing at homebrewersassociation.org. Offer ends January 4th. Homebrewersassociation.org. Steve Wilkes, welcome to Basic Brewing Video uh, Radio. Radio, James, radio. <laughs> We're not even. <laughs> We haven't even shot another You're show. You're worse than the Raiders. <laughs> We're one play in and you've already fumbled. Is that a sports thing? <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a sports reference. <laughs> well, this is our uh, annual disaster show. I don't know how many years we've been doing this, but uh, it's a popular thing. People like to hear other people's mess-ups. <laughs> it has, be- it has <laughs> by default, become the holiday show. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this will be the run the last week of the year. Mm-hmm. And I have to remind everybody before I forget, download your Disaster oh, Show right. Bingo PDF. Yeah. Uh, I'll put a link in uh, on Twitter and then the uh, description of this episode on basicbrewingradio.com. Uh, what it is is a, um, it's a grid, a blank grid, 4x4 four four grid. And then up above it has 20 uh, things that you could put... You make your own bingo card. <laughs> right. There's no free space, but you make your own. Out of these 20 items, number one, angry spouse blood. Number three, beer slash wort spill slash spray. That's almost <laughs> like a free space. <laughs> yeah. Number four, broken glass. Number five, foreign object in beer. Six, tipsy brewer. Seven, bad pun. Bad pun from the host. Well, that's almost, that's a guarantee <laughs> that's as well. That's a free space for sure. Uh, number eight, award one. Number nine, beer dumped. Number 10, late night. Number 11, leaky keg. Number 12, fire. <laughs> <laughs> number 13, secret repairs. That's, you know, the wife is away and you yeah. broke something and you fixed it before she knew. Or husband, could be either way. Number 14, obscure host reference. That's a free space. Number 15, weird ingredient. Number 16, brewing upgrade. Number 17, stuck sparge. Number 18, bottle bomb. Number 19, helpful spouse. And number 20, ruined floor slash furniture. (laughs) We've probably had each of those at one point or another in our brewing careers. (laughs) Pretty much. And uh, they're the same every year, so I didn't didn't make new ones for this this particular uh, year. Because it seems like there's always uh, threads, uh, you know, c- c- uh, common threads going through these things. I thought that I thought we were going to do shoots and ladders this year <laughs> instead of bingo. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> we're sh- we can shoot some beer. We can shoot some beers. We we got uh, for the maybe third or fourth year. We've got beers from uh, our buddy Scott Housel, who sends in disaster show beers, and then we got two beers from. Uh, we have an additional uh, uh, Tom Brennan also sent in some uh, disaster show Sweet. beers as well. So we got a six pack of uh, homebrews to Tom. taste while we're while we're uh, while we're talking. Yeah, and we're sipping on uh, the first one from Scott Housel. This is the Solera Flambic. He says, "I'm in Florida and don't call it Lambic, hence Flambic. A YU 3278 and some different dregs. Bottle carbonated." He says it's from his Solaritype project done in glass carboys with various used oak wine sticks to try to simulate barrel aging and hopefully retain some yeast and bacteria in the wood. And uh, cheers, by the way. Clunk. Clink. With the plastic uh, cups. What do you think? I like it. We've been sipping on it here for a minute or so. and It's very complex. It's it's. Light. I mean, the the, uh, the tartness lightens it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's definitely got a. It, it's it's got some funk going on in there. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah. It's nice and fairly clean, but there's some like there's some funk around the edges. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's nicely tart. It, it's you can, not, I do taste the wood. I, there is wood in there. Yep. As I well. get I get wood. I get. Uh, it's not muddy. The the flavors are real mm. real clear. So yeah. Mm. Um, 
but it's delicious. You said that that it it reminded you of kombucha a little bit, and the level of tartness. Yeah. Is that around most kombuchas that I've had? You know, just a nice clean. Mm -hmm. You know, not too not too astringent. Right. Uh, but nice. That's real. It's actually it's actually really refreshing. Mm -hmm. I told myself that I wasn't going to drink. <laughs> the whole sample of each of these, but <laughs> I'm well on my way <laughs> to drinking that one. So thanks to Scott. Uh, my, I figure that you know every every three stories we get to try another beer. I like that ratio. <laughs> I, I knew him well. The <laughs> ratio. Ratio. <laughs> okay. Now here's for those. Uh, uh, oh, and and where. Usually we sh we send out like a goodie bag of like hops and and maybe some some dry yeast and some little doodads from sponsors mm -hmm. and stuff. Uh, but you don't own the homebrew store anymore, so nope. <laughs> we're going to go in a, in a different direction this year. Where I want to make uh, some hickory smoked uh, jalapeno powder. Nice. And put it put little packets of that. And you have. Uh, volunteered to make something yourself well i've i've been working on my barbecue rubs lately since i'm have more time and uh and i've been barbecuing for 40 years it's not like it's a new thing but i have my own rub my own special rub that i do so my contribution is going to be a packet a serving of my arkansas pit rub and this year's recipe is good on roadkill <laughs> so, I Must call be it fresh. Steve's Steve's <laughs> cluck and squeal. <laughs> so there'll be a, there'll be a packet sufficient for a chicken or a rack of ribs, you know. So that's it's our fun. that's our plans. That's our ambitions. So we'll see how that works out. <laughs> it may take us a while to get it together, <clears throat> but anyway. So my I figure that like every third letter we can have a beer. I may have already said that. Okay, this one is from Jordan uh, in Pratt, Kansas, who says, uh, about a month ago, my first keyser went down. It first tried to freeze my beer, so I replaced the temperature controller, and then the keyser wouldn't stay below about 50 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. I was content with drinking cellar temperature beer for a while, but decided it was time to put the keyser out to pasture. It was a sad day, but trying to look on the bright side, I decided I could upgrade from two taps to four, and that the old keyser could be used as a fermentation chamber until it bit the dust completely. I got the new keyser built, started with a fresh CO2 cylinder, and moved my two kegs of beer over, coffee blonde and hoppy wheat, and kegged one more soon after that uh, for a uh, lakeside bachelor party. Seemingly, everything was going smoothly for about two weeks. This last Friday, I had made the conscious decision to not go to the bottle store because I had plenty of beer on tap at home. I pulled two pints before I noticed the beer was flowing extra slow and made the realization that I was out of CO2. Saturday morning I ran to the auto parts store where I exchanged tanks and they were closed all Memorial Day weekend. I was glad they were spending time with family over the long weekend but sad it would have to do without homebrew for the holiday weekend. After struggling with this ambivalence I decided the homebrew could wait. Also, I really had no other option at this point. Tuesday comes around and I get my tank exchanged and go over all the gas connections and my keyser. After tightening a couple that were looser than I would have liked, I hooked up the CO2 tank and uh, sprayed connections to look for leaks. So you spray a little bit of yep. like star sand. Finding none, I decided to pull the tap on that new IPA I had brewed for the bachelor party to see how it was carbonating. Nothing came out. I tried the taps on the other two kegs. Same sad story. I was pretty baffled at this point. As I was standing there scratching my head, I noticed a thin layer of ice around the bottom of the keyser. Well, that's not good. I purged the kegs and opened them to find them frozen. <laughs> Crestfallen at this point, I opened the keyser, unplugged it, and called it a night. This morning, I decided to go downstairs just to check on everything. Got about halfway down the stairs before I decided that it smelt awfully beery down there. Oh. <laughs> Choice words were said, and I dashed to the keyser to step in a puddle of beer. Apparently, the thawing beer had forced open my taps, my best guess, and, 
and run out onto the basement floor. Our basement floor is stained concrete, so cleanup shouldn't be too bad, I told myself. After starting to sop up the beer and tears, I found a soggy envelope that had fallen between the wall and our filing cabinet. What was in the envelope, you ask? Our marriage license, of course. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> the good news in all this is that there is still at least some beer in the kegs, quality unknown. Long story short, thawing beer in a newly built keezer climbs out of taps, floods basement, and ruins my marriage. Certificate. <laughs> he says, thanks, James. Always love the show, and hopefully someone can learn from my misfortunes. And Jordan, Jordan wrote in with an update. The thawed beer was a hit at the bachelor party, even among those who prefer beer from blue and silver cans. Wow. So they're happy ending. <clears throat> that ticked off several bingo. <laughs> yeah. They pretty much filled my card. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you should be playing along. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nick wrote in uh, originally from Sweden and is now in Glasgow. Uh, and he initially, he started out the uh, the letter talking about Swedish hops and his mother grows Hala Norgard, Korsta, and Svalov uh, E hops and sends them to, uh, to, to Nick. In Glasgow. In Scotland. Wow. So how cool is that? Very. Anyway, he says, uh, I thought I'd share a disaster story, even if it wasn't too serious and mostly involved a fair bit of cleaning. Earlier this year, I decided to try wouldn't out that, a recipe. Wouldn't that be a wee bit of cleaning? A wee bit of cleaning. <laughs> but, uh, or, that's, or, the, or is that Irish? I don't know. Do they do, do, they do wee bits in Scotland as well? I think they do well? wee bits. <laughs> uh, earlier this year, I decided to try out a recipe for a sherry-like fruit wine of my grandmother's making. This involved crushing a fair bit of fruit, and I had decided to split this into two small five-liter buckets. Unfortunately, I had calculated the volume wrong and ended up with a situation where the concoction wouldn't fit. So in my haste, I decided that one of my three-gallon carboys would have to do. This got a, got a bit too full for comfort as well, but this is my first time brewing a fruit wine directly from the pulp, and I thought little of it. At worst, I figured the must might go through the airlock a little, similar to what can happen to a beer. That's foreshadowing, by the mm -hmm. way. But no, seeing that I found a yeasty, pulpy mi mixture in the ceiling the next morning, <laughs> oh, boy. as well as the rest of the room, I have to guess that the pulp grain mixture forms formed some sort of cork in the carboy, allowing for pressure to build up. Needless to say, I spent the next morning cleaning this up and trying to get rid of the smell, as my partner thought it smelled like something associated with too heavy drinking, <laughs> if I put it that way. <laughs> it's slightly used... Uh, uh, a beverage. Luckily, by the time she got back from work, I had managed to clean it up, so she mostly had a right laugh at my expense. Regardless, the remainder of the fruit wine turned out rather well and even tasted a bit like sherry, even if the recipe isn't at all related, as was promised in my grandmother's notes. So instead of grandma's bat, well, in uh, grandma's bathroom smells like wine, I guess. Uh, lastly, I'd like to say that I absolutely love the show and I have learned a lot from it. I've been brewing mead and beer for maybe six years now. And though I've hardly managed to listen to all your episodes, your podcast certainly helped me get started and has always served to teach me new things. I'll have to thank my partner, as it was she who found your podcast. Oh, well, wow. there you go. <clears throat> well, thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. Very, <clears throat> kind, very kind words. And, and say, say hello to your partner as well. Yeah. So, pulp in the, pulp in the airlock. Pulp in the airlock. Yep. <laughs> That's, <laughs> you know, uh, Fred... My customer Fred, he had a, he, he was using a, a you know a bucket a six and a half gallon bucket to ferment a beer, and he came in one day after he had fermented the beer and it was a kit I'd sold him, and he was perplexed because the lid, not just the airlock but the lid had blown off, <laughs> and covered his the room it was in and. Uh, he he didn't he wasn't angry at me but he wanted to be angry at someone <laughs> it was just one of those <laughs> and, I, and uh, I, I think he was hoping i'd take responsibility <laughs> i had a, i can't remember which batch it was but i had a a uh, had a a stopper pop on a on a on a carboy this year it didn't hit the ceiling 
But luckily, I had it, I had the carboy in the bathtub because I figured something was going to happen. Yeah. So it wasn't a disaster, but you know. Yeah. And it was easy to clean up because I just <laughs> showered it down there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a peach mead that blew chunks once. It was. <laughs> oh, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty much everywhere. Literally chunks. Yeah, literally. Up. Oh. Up. Oh, that's our ride. Got sirens coming. We're outside, by the way. It's again shirt sleeves weather. It's amazing. It's it's probably around seventy degrees, and it's December. What is it? Thirteenth. Thirteenth. Crazy. Philip says hello, James, and warm greetings from Israel. He lives in Haifa, Israel, and he's been he's been brewing since two thousand eleven. Before I tell you about my homebrewing disaster, I would like to thank you and Steve for your amazing podcast and YouTube channel. You bring a huge contribution to the hobby, and your content is ex inspiring the entire homebrewing community worldwide. Well, thank you, Philip. I say that mostly for you, I think, so you can you can <laughs> share the praise. Sometimes I skip over the, the nice things that people say in emails and stuff, but uh, on the air, at least. This does that. Philip says this disaster happened during the lockdown of global of the global pandemic crisis when I started working from home. That time, a new product appeared in the homebrewing market that allows you to connect a regular corny keg to your water system supply and have a constant sparkling water supply from your beer tap. Well, wow. That sounds kind of cool. Yeah. <clears throat> I was so happy and thrilled to have one of those next to my other beer taps, so I ordered it without some crucial connectors that were out of stock at that time. I was thinking that I could replace them with other connectors that I have in my home brewery. Wrong assumption, Philip yep. says. When the product arrived, it took me 45 minutes of hooking the pipes and tubes, and my new sparkling water setup was ready, or so I thought. I filled the keg with water and let it chill enough. Then I hooked the gas line for carbonation for the night. The next morning, I woke up early and started a work Zoom meeting with my fellow colleagues. <clears throat> After a few minutes into the meeting, I realized that there's a strange, quiet noise of dripping water coming from the kitchen where my keyser is located. I waited for the end of the meeting and went to investigate the origin of the dripping sounds. When I entered the kitchen, I saw that the floor was covered with water uh, dripping from my keyser. At this point, I realized that my 400 liter, about 100 gallon keyser is filled with water. And a, oh, and no. a similar amount of water is already spilled all over the kitchen. So it's like coming out of the top yeah. after filling up the uh, keyser. Another thought that ran into my mind was that my wife is still sleeping and she probably will wake up soon. <laughs> I, I, I understood that I needed to act fast to eliminate the consequences of this homebrewing disaster. The first thing I did was to unplug the keyser from the AC power. That's smart. That's a good <laughs> yeah. Then I ran to our bedroom to turn off the alarm clock <laughs> so my wife won't wake up during this crisis. Then I ran to my shed to fetch any available rags, buckets, and mops to start mopping the kitchen. After a few minutes, I realized it would take hours to clean this up, so I needed to speed up the process before my wife woke up. As a creative home brewer, I have many spare pumps that were used in different setups I had in home brewing projects, so I went again to my shed to fetch any pump that was able to help pump the water out of my wife's site. This, ha this action appeared to be super efficient, and after 10 minutes, most of the water on the floor was gone. Ten minutes. Wow. Jeez. I mopped the floor with a dry towel, and the floor again was dry and shiny. Then the pumping procedure was successful, sucking out the water from my keyser as well. And after another ten minutes, my keyser was empty. Now that's a fast pump. That's a heck of a pump. When my wife appeared in the kitchen, she was surprised at how clean the kitchen floor was. <laughs> <laughs> it took another two weeks for the keyser to dry completely before I hooked it back into the AC power and enjoyed a pint of my delicious homebrew. Since that disaster, I bought the missing connectors for my sparkling water tap in my keyser and even put an electric auto shutoff valve to eliminate the chances that a similar disaster will happen again. Well, there you go. And, and, uh, and he sent photos. Maybe I'll maybe I'll post that on the social media. One of the photos. Now that's two keyser, two flooded keysers, two flooded keysers, <laughs> <laughs> and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> um, okay, it's time for a beer. Number two from uh, Scott is the honey ginger saison. Oh, nice. Where is that one? Oh, it's this one. <clears throat> Where's my where's my keys? Speaking of keys, where's my keys? 
a honey ginger saison. That's that sounds actually delightful. Uh, dee -dee, dee -dee. Ooh, nice. nice Pretty. Bit of, nice bit of foam on that one. Beautiful. I drank my first sample after saying I wouldn't. Yeah, drink I did too. He says, uh, mm. you tried an all-grain version of this on the 2019 disaster show and seemed to really like it. Then my next batch of it leaked five gallons all over my laundry room <laughs> floor the day before I was going to bottle it. <laughs> Luckily, one of my few disasters, made with 35% honey, 65% pale DME, brewed because I had been learning and practicing how to brew hazy pale ale, so I was drinking a lot of them and brewed a few. I had just started kegging, and I wanted something Belgian-y that I could make quickly. Success, he says. So what do you think? It's nice. Definitely got the... Definitely a saison. Oh, nice. Um, the honey comes through brilliantly. The ginger comes through brilliantly. Yeah. Well, that ginger's um, nice. Yeah. It's got a nice spice to it. Yep. In got addition... Some... In, addi in addition... <laughs> I've had <laughs> half a beer. In addition to the uh, the ginger, there is also a spice from, I guess, the, probably the yeast. I would think so, yeah. Um, mm. So yeah, I, I get some, get like a, a pepper, like a black black pepper or grains of paradise kind mm. of thing going on. Oh yeah. Well, that's super good. I need to use more ginger. It's time for your Marianne joke. It's yeah, I was gonna. <laughs> <coughs> I'm just going to number those from now on. It's a number. That's a number seven. Yeah. So yeah, I tell people. I tell people I only have like 27 stories. That's right. In my repertoire. Well, what is it? The Greeks say there's only 12 plots. Is that what they say? I, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Well, only in Greece. Yeah. They yeah. yeah there's, there's actually just 12 plots that you could write about, and everything else <laughs> is a variation on those. They they haven't met. Uh, uh, who's the Twin Peaks director? Oh, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> Look, there goes my reference. There goes my. <laughs> That's so obscure. I don't even know it. Oh, for uh, oh, people are screaming at their. I'll, it'll come to me later. Um. Hmm. That's super good. Boy, that's really good. Yeah. I like that spice. It's very holiday-ish. Yeah, it is. Not David Byrne. Oh. Uh, uh. See, I never watched Twin Peaks. Boom, 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 boom. Have a nice cup of coffee and some pie. Scott writes in, I'm a relatively new brewer having brewed batch number 38 since starting my brewing career in the summer of 2019. Wow. My homebrew started to get to the level where I felt it wasn't torture to feed to other humans. When out of the blue, a global pandemic started, so literally everything I know about brewing I've learned from books, YouTube, online forums, and podcasts, including your very own Basic Brewing Radio. So it is with much glee that I stumbled upon your annual Brewing Disasters episodes, which were immediately consumed en masse. <laughs> I must say, as a physician, many of the stories that have been told on your podcast make me cringe. Well, us too. Us too, Scott. Dr. Scott. Fortunately, I don't have any serious disaster stories to share. No broken glass, no 10-gallon boiling wort spills, no trips to the ER. But my brewing disaster could have easily ended in murder with me as the victim. Dun, dun, dun. After extract batch number five, I switched to an all-in-one 120-volt electric system so I can brew in my basement. One batch with the stock malt pipe and the resulting messy cleanup, and I decided it was E... Brew in a bag for me. I found that the cleaning and tidying processes are just about as involved and intricate as the mashing and brewing itself. The cleanup part of the brew day is where my brewing disaster takes us, astonishing as it may sound. This story begins after yeast pitch, when everything should be simple and straightforward, right? Wrong! After dumping, dumping the 13 pounds of grain in my compost pile, I went straight back inside to clean the brew bag in the utility sink on our ground floor laundry room. I turned on the hot water and started rinsing out the bag. After a few minutes of fussing, I put a drain plug in the sink and set the bag in the rinsing warm water. I've got other things to clean up in the basement, I said to myself. Uh, foreshadowing. <laughs> so off I went, making a mental note to return in a few minutes to turn the running water off and finish cleaning the brew bag. I certainly wouldn't forget about the running water, right? 
You all know where this is going. While in my basement tidying up some other things, and after what only seemed like three minutes, I started to hear a strange sound <coughs> coming from behind the door to the unfinished part of the basement. It sounded like dripping water. Hmm, I thought. We don't have any faucets in the unfinished area. That must be water softener cycling. Oh, th only this and nothing more. A couple minutes later, the sound of dripping water got louder. Now the volume of a bubbling creek or a running shower or a small waterfall. <laughs> it was at this time I remembered oh. the utility sink. I ran into the unfinished part of our basement to see water dripping through the ceiling just below the location of our utility sink. That's it. I'm a dead man. Fortunately, my wife was out on errands. <laughs> there is always the wife. The wives are out of town or asleep. Or <laughs> so if I work quickly, I can clean up the mess and she'll never know, right? Towels, towels, and more of towels. Dehumidifier stat to the laundry room. That's doctor talk. Mop in the basement, or mop the floor in the basement. Every drop of water was accounted for. That's it, I've pulled it off. <clears throat> My wife was still out doing errands. I was safe, and certain death had eluded me. Everything was fine until my wife discovered ten soaking wet beach towels in the laundry bin. <laughs> she asked what on earth had happened, and uh, that is when I fessed up. I had flooded the house while cleaning up after a relatively uneventful brew day. She was glad that I had not made a bigger mess, no damage requiring a house remodel, no electrocutions, no trips to the ER. You'd have thought that I would have learned my lesson, right? Unfortunately not. I did the same thing again two more times. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but this time in my basement sink, but with far less mess and consequence. I've gotten away with those last two blunders because of the smaller volume of water. She'll never know. <laughs> you know what strikes me that we could go into the into the blackmail business. <laughs> dear dear Mrs. Doctor Scott. <laughs> That's a lovely car you got there. I'd hate for anything to happen to it. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I I need a little a sip of something to wet my whistle here. Hmm. Wow. That's that's very tasty. It's very drinkable. Yeah. Quaffable. It's like a cookie, a ginger snap. John from Indiana, also known as Storm Crow from HBT. Homebrew talk, I'm assuming. John says, use good hose clamps. Shortest well, disaster show story ever. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Short, declarative. <laughs> Having a couple of years brewing under our belts now, my wife and I have become quite the team. We can usually pull off a five-gallon brew-in-a-bag batch on the kitchen stove of an evening like a well-oiled machine. A few weeks ago, on one such evening, things were rolling along nicely. The boil was completed, and I had carefully moved the hot kettle full of wort over by the sink to begin the cooling process. The immersion chiller had been placed in the kettle for the last couple of minutes of the boil. Our usual process is to run the garden hose through the kitchen window to supply the chiller. We learned early on that the first few seconds after the water is turned on from the hydrant outside can get interesting due to air being purged through the hoses and the reaction of cold water colliding with a little bit of boiling temp water already in the chiller. That's for sure. Boy, that you can your uh, wort chiller usually mine usually goes through convulsions, you know, as the air comes out and yeah. things are happening. <clears throat> John says, that being the case, my wife has always held the end of the discharge hose coming out of the chiller into the kitchen sink drain and covered it with the kettle lid to keep water from splashing everywhere during the startup phase, while I'm the one who goes out into the dark to turn the hydrant on. After numerous brews, I've grown accustomed to hearing my wife shriek and burst into laughter as I'm walking back toward the kitchen after turning on the water. It never fails. The hose sputters and twitches in her hand. Well, so <laughs> surprising her every time. <laughs> now, now, be nice. <laughs> That's and, <a> number eight. <laughs> Double entendre is not in the bingo thing. Should be. And there's usually an initial small splash of water that makes it out, to the sink, out of the sink despite her best efforts. On this particular night, I heard the familiar shriek, but instead of the usual laughter, I was horrified to hear my wife screaming, Shut it off! Shut it off! Shut it off! I could tell from her voice that the problem was more serious than a mess in the kitchen. 
I sprinted back to the hydrant, shut it off, then crashed into the kitchen to find my precious wife moaning and clutching her right shoulder. Oh, no. It turns out that she had tried to kink the discharge hose a little to mitigate the startup sputter until a steady, manageable flow was achieved. The pressure created by doing this caused the manufacturer-installed hose clamp to immediately fail on that line, which resulted in my wife getting sprayed with boiling hot water from inside the chiller directly on her right shoulder. Oh, geez. Yeah, no kidding. John says, thank God it missed her face and eyes. If the hose had been held for even a few seconds that night, uh, or if the hose had held for even a few seconds that night, the water coming out would have been substantially cooler and we would have been simply mopping the floor. This, <clears throat> this was a worst case scenario, for sure. She's made a full recovery now. That's good. Her arm looks like nothing happened, but she was in horrible pain for days, I bet. The blistering and skin loss she suffered initially was enough to make the children cry when they saw it. Aww. It helped clean, I helped clean the wound and wrap it for two weeks. Pretty serious stuff, but we know, we both know it could have been a lot worse. It was a freak accident. I'm not mad at the manufacturer for using a crappy hose clamp. Clamps like those are usually pretty good. This one just didn't get crimped down tight enough. I've replaced it with a worm gear style clamp like the ones we use on the farm, screwed down tight. We've also started trying to drain the immersion chiller better after each use and have brewed a couple of batches since then without incident. It wouldn't be accurate to say we've never been careless. That makes the accident all the more frustrating, but we can say from the experience that hot liquid is no joke. Be careful, everyone. Thanks, wow. John. I'm glad glad the missus is, is better. That, I bet that was painful. There's nothing oh. that hurts like a scalding burn. I showed you my... my did I show you the picture of my, the blister I got on my finger? I actually I had those uh, I had those uh, those they call them of gloves. Oh yeah, those like woven you know gloves. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're made of, but uh, I was I was about I was draining some pasta and I accidentally dipped my knuckle in the boiling hot water. Yeah. And in the two seconds it took to get that glove off, right? You know, it scalded the. And luckily, it w only was like one layer deep, but. I, I can send you a picture of that uh, <laughs> blister. It was quite impressive. It looked like I was wearing a ring for a few oh, days after that. Oh, God. Oof. I picked up a, a skillet that I had, an iron skillet I had in the oven baking, oh. roasting something, you know, mm. and just just forgot and just went to move it, you know, around on the stovetop and grabbed it. Yep. Didn't last long. Nope. <laughs> That's when your 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 hand thinks faster than you do. Oh boy. It's like you see your hand throw the throw the pan across <laughs> the <laughs> and then you feel the the pain afterwards. Yeah, so anyway, yeah. Hot oh, that's a serious one. It's a very serious one. I, I don't so, even want to make a joke about that. No. Hot liquid hot the boiling wort is no At least he didn't send a picture. <laughs> I didn't get a picture one time. <laughs> a brewer had uh, uh, used an Erlenmeyer flask uh, to make a starter, and uh, it, he, tr he like touched the flask, and then it boiled over on his <clears throat> So he sent a picture. Ooh. Don't send pictures <laughs> <laughs> of your injuries. Uh, Justin from Tulsa, home of High Gravity Brewing. Yeah. He says, a few months back, you interviewed my good friend Johannes Fahrenkrug about his brew in a Ziploc bag method for small batch beers. That's where they use uh, sous vide mm -hmm. to uh, brew, and and uh, Johannes came up with an idea that he would put uh, his his mash in Ziploc bags in the bath, and that way it would keep the uh, the sous vide stick free of debris. Yeah, better. Anyway. Uh, Justin says, before the interview, being the magnanimous friend I am, I offered to give his method a shot and give him my feedback and promised I would write in for the disaster show if, they, if things didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> so here's how it went. <laughs> Justin says, I decided to do a double batch in two separate one-gallon Ziploc bags held at temp in the same water bath, which is one advantage of doing the Ziploc bag. Method. Yeah. One to be a no-boil nipa, and the other a simple black lager. After milling my grain, I went to the drawer and just grabbed the bags I had handy. Ziplocs from the dollar store. First mistake. Mm. 
I got my water bath to strike temperature and attempted to put the first Ziploc full to capacity with grains and hot water into the water bath slash sparge water. As I tried to seal the bag, I realized the minuscule particles of grain dust on the seals were a hurdle these 99 cent bags were simply incapable of overcoming. I kept trying until the heat from the mash got to be too much for delicate fingers. With a little pain and a lot of frustration, I tossed the first bag of mash into the sink. Mistake number two. Pushed on by nothing but love for my good friend and a serious case of the stupids, <laughs> I went to work on sealing the second bag, as it inevitably joined its brother in the sink with a disappointing plop. <laughs> nothing like a disappointing plop. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. I took a. <laughs> that's, a number, that's number seven. <laughs> I took a good look at the mess I had made, a sink now filled with a little over four pounds of grain, and instead of pausing for even the slightest moment to think about what I was doing or to reevaluate my decision-making abilities, I turned on the disposal and hoped for the best. Oh, boy. Mistake the third. After an hour of hopeless plunging and wrestling with a 12-foot drain snake that seemed to have completely failed to accomplish anything, I broke down and called Roto-Rooter. Determined to at least get something brewing related done that evening, I went to the bathtub to dump out a recently kicked keg that I had filled with OxyClean earlier in the day. It was at this point I learned that my plunging had indeed managed to accomplish something. It had pushed the grain down the line far enough that now not only was the kitchen sink blocked up, but so was the bathtub. <clears throat> I'm sure my wife appreciated having to hear my angry outbursts at our drainage system just as much as she appreciated the completely avoidable bill from the plumber. In a futile attempt to calm me down, Johannes sent me some cash on Apple Pay to cover the grain bill and ease my pain and suffering. <laughs> Despite my protest that this fiasco was not due to his process, but 100% or 10,000% my own stupidity, humbled to try it again a few weeks later with better bags and a bit more common sense and had great success. I've since enjoyed using he, his BIZB method for a couple small batch experiments. I try to learn from my brewing disasters, and this, from this one I learned, number one, don't trust dollar store Ziplocs. Number two, grains plus sink does not equal brewing. Grains plus sink equals plumbing. And number three, Johannes is a pretty good dude, and if anyone anywhere ever has any issues when brewing with a Ziploc, he 100% will send you money, no questions asked. <laughs> <laughs> Checks will not be honored. Checks will not be honored. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You might want, you might want to check with Johannes before you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, was that three? Was that three? Yes, it was three. Three, three, three mints in one. Okay. Next we have. Oh, I I, need, I might need to rinse after that. Can you pour me a, a spot of a rinse water and a spot of water? Just spot a spot. Water. Yeah. Don't don't. <laughs> We poured it directly over that that uh, recorder. That probably wasn't, no. <laughs> wasn't the smartest thing to do, but it worked out. We got away with it. Okay, next on the list is the hibiscus flambic. Oh, flambic with hibiscus. It's <laughs> <laughs> a no nonsense beer name in there. <laughs> it sounds like a Karnak drunk gone bad. <laughs> hibiscus <laughs> with lambic with hibiscus. <laughs> What's the diagnosis I got from my doctor last week? <laughs> Ooh, that's a pretty beer. Yeah. You know, there's on, on Pluto TV, there's a Johnny Carson channel that's just 24 hours a day old Johnny Carson episodes. Wow. As opposed to the new ones. <laughs> <laughs> right. <clears throat> Ooh, what's this? Uh, what do you think? It's very drinkable. Ooh, it's tart. It may not be as tart as the previous it's, two. It's not. Mm -mm. It's um. It's uh. It's a lot softer, as a matter of fact. I think. Mm. Oh, I do get some floral characteristics. Mm-hmm. Scott says, one year old with hibiscus added after a month, or added for a month. He says, I think it could take more hibiscus. I might agree with that, although, although I, I do get a floral character. I was going to say I don't. 
Oh, I think it's got the exact right amount of hibiscus. Oh, I thought you meant you don't get floral stuff. No, I do. I, but I don't think it needs any more. No, I think you're. I think you're right on. I think it's. I think it's really good. The uh, in fact, a problem that I have with hibiscus, hibiscus mm. beverages in general, is they're almost always way too hibiscusy for me. They lean into the uh, potpourri. They're very potpourri-ish. David Lynch. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I'd get it. <laughs> I feel better now. David Lynch is a director. Uh, so, the, who said who said there are only twelve? The Greeks said there are only twelve. Twelve plots. Well, they never saw a David Lynch film. I'm I'm sure that's true. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's my quick wit. <laughs> I was going to say Josh Whedon, but I knew that wasn't right. <laughs> but probably along the same line. Yeah. Or uh, or what's his name? Uh, oh God, director of uh, Ghost. Uh, or the you know those movies with the surprise endings. I don't the, know. Uh... Oh Henry. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait. <laughs> I'm really dating myself now. <laughs> M. Night Shyamalan. Uh, okay. <laughs> you just keep blurting them out, and I'll just keep agreeing. <laughs> Whew. Boy, I would not. This is not the mind that should go on Jeopardy. <laughs> I'm like answering questions. <laughs> or ans I'm, I'm questioning answers. Yeah. Whatever they do on Jeopardy, like, you know, five minutes later. <laughs> I'll take the tit snow <laughs> for 800, Trebek. A <laughs> little bum cover. <laughs> that was the one I was trying to come up with. <laughs> oh, God. That's an album cover. <laughs> This hibiscus beer is lovely. Yes, it is. Yeah, we digress. Nice. Ooh, I enjoy that quite a bit. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to take a break to talk about my Kettle Sour Passion Fruit Ale that I finally got a chance to brew. You know, I've been talking about it forever. And uh, since it was extremely warm on Christmas Day here in northwest Arkansas, and the boys, uh, you know, they're in their 20s now, they, know the, they, they, they don't wake us up anymore at 5 a.m. to open presents. Go figure. I put on my shorts, and I brewed on the patio. I just did a simple mash with 10 pounds of American two-row, collected my wort, and brought it up to the boil, just to the boil, to sanitize. And then I chilled it to around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that's around 38 C, and transferred it into a five-gallon carboy on top of a packet of W25 Lacto Brevis from our friends and sponsors at Imperial Organic Yeast. Lactobrevis is a lactobacillus strain now available in homebrew pouches from Imperial. It's awesome for souring unhopped wort, just like mine. So I put the carboy with the lactobrevis from Imperial Organic Yeast in, my, in a water bath in my electric brew in a bag system from high gravity, and I set the mash mode to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's around 38 C. And by the next morning, the pH had dropped to 4.2. And the morning after that, the pH was 3.4. So I tasted the wort, and it tasted really clean and nicely tart. And so after transferring the wort back into the kettle, out of the carboy, I boiled it for 15 minutes, uh, adding an ounce or 28 grams of Czech Sots at the beginning of that short boil. I then chilled and pitched uh, AO1 House from Imperial, which is going to hopefully uh, give a nice, clean fermentation. And my plan is to, to pitch passion fruit puree into the fermenter bucket after primary fermentation. So I'm really looking forward to that. You know we love Imperial Organic Yeast with a pitch rate of 200 billion cells in every easy-to-open package. My stir plate is dusty because I don't use it anymore for standard gravity 5-gallon batches. And my airlock is usually bubbling before bedtime. Ask your local homebrew store about Imperial Organic Yeast and check them out at imperialyeast.com. That's imperialyeast.com. Leo from Melbourne, Australia. Melbourne. Leo says, I built an awesome keezer. 
It has four taps and space for four kegs, and that little shelf inside is good to store a few bottles, cans, and my box of hops. I put a nice one-inch timber on top of it, a timber collar, and a timber base with casters. It's really pretty. I will add a picture. That's, oh, wow. that's it there at the bottom. That's very, very nice. nice. I have little disasters every time I brew, <laughs> <laughs> Well, but never think them worthy of the Basic Brewing Disaster Show. This year, the first stupid thing I did was to try and build a new house during the pandemic. We've been living in a tiny rental, and the shed is pretty basic. No water or drainage. Not a great brew area. Melbourne also went into a total of six months of lockdown with no travel beyond <coughs> five kilometers or three miles from your house, only allowed out for 30 minutes each day, Jeez. and a night curfew at 8 p.m., we had to get brewing ingredients through the post, which was slow. No problem. I just stored them in my awesome keyser until they all turned up and I could squeeze time in my 23.5 hours of lockdown time each day to brew. So come time to brew, I didn't have a proper bench. I thought, I'll just wheel the keyser outdoors and put my rig on top of the keyser because it's such a sturdy big unit. <laughs> That's my nickname in high school. <laughs> sturdy big unit. <laughs> I use a Braumeister German electric all-in-one brew-in-a-basket style machine. <clears throat> it's awesome, but weighs a lot. 20 kilograms or more. I lifted on top of the keyser. I uh, lifted it on top of the keyser, which is no mean feat. Fit it with 25 liters of water from the garden hose. Oh boy! And plug it in. So cool! This is going to be an awesome beer. I do the mash. Remove the grains. All going well. Smells great. Outdoor electric brewing is awesome. I get it up to a good rolling boil for my 60-minute edition. The hops are inside the keyser. Oh. Dough and dough again. 25 liters of boiling wort in a and in a 20 kilogram machine sitting on top of my keyser with the hops stuck inside. <laughs> oh no. Leo says, Mexican standoff. There it is, my brewing disaster entry. I figured out something and nobody got hurt. I just thought of your show when it happened. Now, number one, he didn't tell us what he did. <laughs> didn't tell us what he did to fix the problem. And number two, when nowadays, now when people screw up on brew day, the first thing they think of is us. Well, yeah, so, well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Leo says, the good news is my house is almost finished and I have built a shed with a brew bench, sink, hot and cold water, and a vent. So happy days ahead. Ooh, thanks for your awesome podcast, which keeps inspiring me to brew. Thanks, Leo, from Melbourne. Excellent. You know, Box of Hops is one of my favorite Dr. Seuss books. <laughs> <laughs> Box of Hops on Pop. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, I wonder what he did. I think he must have done. I think he must have done perhaps a no chill. So well, move it out of there. But he didn't have any hops. His hops are in the keyser. That's right. So you would have to, well, like a like a hop stand, but you'd put it into the no chill yeah maybe, vessel yeah maybe racked and, it into and a, then into racked a, it yeah. onto hops. Oh, oh, that's that would be my. I was trying to think of how you how you would do that. <clears throat> One of those choose your own choose your own ending stories. That's right, <laughs> Eddie. I don't know. I don't know if uh, Eddie didn't say where Eddie's from. Hi, James. Long time, first time. Like many brewers, I like to pointlessly tinker with my system, <laughs> making time. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm too old now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You'll go blind. <laughs> I like to pointlessly tinker with my system, making tiny tweaks that probably add nothing but make me feel handy. So it was with my old system, a 40-liter uh, tea urn. I bet, I, bet, I bet Eddie's not from here, not from the U.S. Would that be a sweet tea urn? I don't know. <laughs> if it's the South, it is. A 40-liter tea urn that I had made some modifications to and used to make brew-in-a-bag batches. In my last few brews, I'd noticed a lot of hop matter and other gunk getting through into my no-chill cube. Not a big problem, but still one I thought I could try to fix. So I made a little filter out of a tea strainer and stuck it over the inlet of the tap inside the kettle. 
When it came time for my next brew, everything went smoothly until it was time to transfer to my no-chill container. I opened the tap on my kettle, and the filter clogged with lightning speed. <laughs> uh. Now I had a kettle too heavy for me to lift, filled with boiling sugar water. I discovered that if I whacked my brew spoon against the filter, <laughs> a, tiny, has it done that? a tiny amount of wort could trickle through. <laughs> and so I did that for what felt like hours. <laughs> Finally enough had dripped out so that I could lift the kettle and with the aid of a funnel, tip the remainder into my cube. But in all this filter whacking... <laughs> The wort had cooled below sterilization temps, and the cube had been open to the air this whole time. I hazily remembered a brewlosophy article about hot side aeration not being a concern for home brewers, so I tore out my makeshift filter and dumped the wort back into the kettle to heat it back to near boiling before transferring back into the cube, this time with a mighty unimpeded stream. <laughs> I remember those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those were the days. <laughs> The be <laughs> We're, this is the old old man show. <laughs> no kidding. The beer turned out so-so, but not from factors related to my genius filter. This days, I'm very zen about hop matter and gunk getting into my no-chill cube. Me too, Eddie. I just <laughs> it all goes. <laughs> Thanks for all you and Steve do. I look forward to a new episode every week. I brewed your Mexican lager recipe for a party the other day, and it was a hit. Yay! Awesome. Take another sip of this hibiscus. Hibiscus. Hibiscus, just fun to say. Mmm. I like that. That might be my favorite so far. Really? Yeah. I like the ginger one quite a bit, but this is nice. It's nice and um, it's a lot more subtly flavored yes. than the ginger one, which is. Um, it's. I appreciate that. Bruce. My wife, Bruce says, my wife and I are in a group of empty nesters, families where the children are old enough to no longer live at home. As are we. As are we. We try to do some things with other families approximately monthly. The group was seeking some new ideas, so I volunteered to make some home-brewed beers and have a beer tasting. I created a menu of five beers, a Hefeweizen, an American Wheat, an Imperial Saison, a British Bitter, and last but no le not least, a Berliner Weiss. Wow. How do I get to be Bruce's neighbor? <clears throat> I had brewed all of the beers before, except for the Berliner, but I figured for such a low ABV beer, it wouldn't be difficult to use brew in a bag because the mesh bag would be light enough to lift out. My first mistake was that I had never tried to mash out with brew in a bag before, so I heated water to 170 degrees and put it in the cooler at the top of my three-tier system. After mashing at 154 degrees for an hour, I lifted the bag out and, in the most unsafe way possible, poured hot water, water from the cooler over the mesh bag to sparge. In doing so, it poured right down onto my tennis shoe, giving Ooh. me a 170 degree hot foot. As I hopped around pulling off my shoe and sock, I completed the sparge because I wasn't about to lose the mash. Right. <laughs> it's. It's amazing how hot water maintains its temperature, except when you're mashing. <laughs> yeah, the, the uh, yeah the, the the water that spilled on its foot it was just exactly as hot as it, you know, <laughs> but then the mash cooled down twenty degrees probably. Yeah. After completing the sparge, the rest of the brew day went okay. I cooled the wort using a coil wort chiller and pitched USO5 and two vials of lactobacillus. The fermentation proceeded just <clears throat> fine, and in order to get a high level of carbonation, I mixed fresh yeast with dry malt extract to get a vigorous croisin. I mixed that with more corn sugar and water in the bottling bucket and bottled and capped the beer in 22-ounce bombers to achieve what I deemed to be the right level of carbonation. Foreshadowing. The day of the tasting came, and my wife and I placed about three bombers of each beer in an ice bucket on top of the dining room table. I had even found some raspberry syrup to mix with the Berliner Weiss to serve as tradition dictate, dictates. We tasted the first four beers, and when we got to the Berliner, a bottle opener was used, and whoosh! Out came a volcano of highly carbonated beer. <laughs> 
Believing that the first eruption was an aberration, the other two bottles acted the same way. Besides taking a delicious shower and a pretty good beer and having a scalded <laughs> scalded and second or three second or third degree burn that left my foot bright red for many months. Mm. Ooh, I bet that was hard on wearing shoes. I found out uh, where its nickname derived. Apparently, Napoleon called Berliner Weiss the Champagne of the North. Additionally, opening beer over the sink has become a more common practice around my household. <laughs> I bet. Wow. Wow, that's our second scalding. Yep. Hopefully our last. So we've got scalding and keezer. <laughs> that's so right. So far. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, lots of keezers, lots of scaldings. <clears throat> Is it? T- I think it's time for another beer. <clears throat> I don't know. I think your math is off. What? <laughs> it wasn't three. I don't. i I've lost track. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that was three. Okay. Mm. I'm in favor of that. May I have another splash of rinse water, please? And let's not pour it over the over the recorder. I don't want to tempt fate the second time. <clears throat> the second time. All right. The fourth and final beer. Blue collar. What? Oh, no, wait. (laughs) That's blue collar waker. (laughs) There's no. (laughs) Blue collar waker. (laughs) I've been called a few times. There's no in in that. I love that song. Fruited wheat beer. Okay. <laughs> a blue collar. <laughs> I might have to bleep that. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's something bad. There's, it, if you're, you're a does it mean? It just means you're kind of a. You're kind of a. <laughs> this is ooh. This is a. A little more happy than. <laughs> <laughs> the blue collar waker is a little happier than the others. Ooh. It's boy, oh, it's beautiful. So it's a you know, forgive me, it's a it's a just a fruited wheat beer. It is a impromptu blueberry wheat made because my wife asked for it at the right time because I had just brewed two days in a row and purposely had three gallons of wheaty wort without a plan. Named for our dog Waker, <laughs> J.D. Salinger character name. I hope it held up. The last one I had reminded me of a blueberry champagne we used to get from a local winery when we lived in New Jersey. Wow. So cheers, oh, yeah. to, cheers to Scott for yeah. thunk. Ooh, it's beautiful. Ooh, that's nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very blueberry. Speaking of dogs, Jesse, you want to come up here? Jump up. I'm not going to pick you up. you got to go over there. <laughs> that's one spoiled dog. Ooh, that's nice. Out of the four, I think it's between the um, honey ginger saison and the, and the hibiscus for me. And I was leaning toward the ginger. Now I'm leaning toward the hibiscus. This one is nice as well, though. Yeah, I mean, they've all, they, they have all been nice beers, and I've enjoyed all four. Mm. Um mm-hmm. And, they're, Ooh, and they've all been good. very different, yeah. which is nice. Yeah, very good. Hey, we've got a new year coming up, and it's a great time to explore new areas of deliciousness. So may I suggest craft meads from our friends and sponsors, Ricky and Kelly of Groenfell and Havoc Meaderies up in Vermont. Now, I know a lot of you are already familiar with the deliciously drinkable craft meads from Groenfell and Havoc. But for those who aren't, you might want to check out their mead starter packs. There's the Modern Mead Starter Pack by Havoc, which has a four-pack each of Psychopomp, a sour cherry mead, Hop Swarm, a dry hopped mead, and Root of All Evil, which is a ginger mead and a strong contender for my favorite. It's so good. <laughs> it's so good. Or, or maybe you want to go the uh, classic mead starter pack direction, which features a four-pack each of Valkyrie's Choice, which is a deliciously simple classic craft 
mead. So simple and delicious. Old Wayfarer, an oaked amber mead, and Nordic Farmhouse, which is a classic cranberry mead. And great news, each starter pack comes with free shipping across the country. Everything I've had from Groenfell and Havoc is so good. Great to pair with food or just to sip on its own. Start 2022 with delicious honey-based goodness from Groenfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to fan these out so that I know when I get to the next, the third one. Okay. <laughs> Rick <clears throat> from uh, Something in the Water Brewing Company. Uh, I'm going to say his last name because he's a, he's he's launching a uh, a brewery. Rick, wow. Rick Tan, Tanton, or maybe it's Tanton. No, it's Tanton. Uh, Rick says been listening for about nine years now. Wow. So I'm very excited to, to finally have a story. I feel he's excited to have a disaster. <laughs> so I'm, see the effect we have on people. So I'm very excited to, to finally have a story I feel may be worthy of being read on air. Love you guys and all you do, and I'm sending a personal thank you as my brewery opens March 1st in Toronto's Liberty Village. Jeez. And my weekly listens to BBR, as well as my 2013 purchases of your DVDs, were instrumental in getting me here. Wow, isn't that nice? Wow. Uh, well, I appreciate that, Rick. And congratulations. And if you're in uh, Toronto... Around March 1st, look for Something in the Water Brewing Company. And hopefully uh, there won't be disasters. But he's learned his lessons, so he's uh, he, everything will be delicious, I'm sure. Uh, Rick says, I've been in the midst of finally going pro for the past year, brewing test batches for the brewery at home in the kitchen on an electric all-in-one system. You notice the electric systems are pretty popular. They are taking the brewing world by storm. <laughs> uh, one we really got excited about was a Rattler, where we brew a golden ale and then blend it to 2.5% with fresh local strawberry and rhubarb juices. Oh, Ooh. that would be delicious, actually. It does sound really good. Yeah. Brew day for the golden ale was super uneventful, as it was a recipe I've done many times before. Got it done and transferred, pitched the yeast... And as Confucius once said, it was bubbling before bedtime. <laughs> that was that's that's con confused just <laughs> it was referring to me. <laughs> the next day, I had found a rhubarb. I had found a rhubarb farm about ninety minutes away, and decided to do the drive, catch up on brewing podcasts, and go get fresh rhubarb juice from the farm. On the way back, I snagged fresh strawberries and got home in time to process them into a juice and freeze them for a bit. Finally, the day arrived, and bear with me if you now see this end coming. <laughs> Combined my juice, strawberries, and rhubarb juice into my fully fermented golden ale. <clears throat> Rather than do any mathematics of any kind, I just decided to assume that the juice would act as a priming sugar. Boy, did it ever. A few nights later, I'm in bed with the wife, and we're startled awake at 4.30 a.m. by the sound of gunshots in the kitchen. I bravely threw on a shirt and snuck down the hall, poised to tackle whatever felon had broken in. I gazed into the kitchen to find no criminals, no broken glass, and no bullet holes. I could, however, hear a gushing noise. Oh. It didn't take long to allow the siren song of the overcarved bottles to summon me into the next room where I could now see a delicious rattler all over the ceiling of the dining room. Oh, boy. <laughs> next steps... Put on my largest winter jacket, eye coverings, and brewing gloves to slowly uncap every single bottle I'd produced. Each explosion was a reminder that, <laughs> that we're meant to measure our priming sugars for a reason. And I have since transitioned to carbonation tabs for every batch since. Oh, and no more unfermented fruit juice. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> That's smart, putting on the gloves and all that stuff. Well, remember uh, one of our very earliest... Basic brewing videos, we uncorked what we thought might be bottle bombs. Do you remember that? 
That might have been the... Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe second or third or fourth video we ever did. And I put bubble wrap around this. Yeah. Because <laughs> we were... Because we, we accidentally double primed uh, at least two, one... car- two carbonation tabs. We, we bottled... It was the first... <clears throat> it was the first six-pack batch of IPA. <clears throat> and we put carbonation drops in every mm-hmm. one. And on the video, if you go back and look, you can see where we added two carbonation drops without knowing... <laughs> <laughs> it didn't blow up. No. It was okay. It was That's like right. the roulette scene from... Um, oh, I see I shouldn't start the a The Deer Hunter? Like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> see, I knew that one with uh, 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 Christopher Walken. Yeah. That's a disturbing movie. Yeah, it is. That's not holiday fair right there. Okay. <clears throat> Andrew. My name is Andrew B. from Chatham, Ontario, Canada. I've been a listener for four years and love every episode. I just, well, thank you, Andrew. Just wanted to drop you a line regarding my recent disaster brew day. Oh, boy, what a day. It it all started with plans to brew a Pilsner this evening. I decided to fill my kettle with filtered water over my lunch hour to let the water sit till later. This usually takes about ten minutes. So I went in to grab a, a bite to eat. <laughs> Which usually takes 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's math. <laughs> he says, foreshadowing number one. Well, as the old adage goes, a watched kettle never boils. An unwatched kettle will always boil over. I would like to add the saying, a kettle with an open valve port will never fill. <laughs> Returning with, pri- with pride and joy... To my newly built garage brewery, after a quick bite to eat, I was horrified to see gallons of water had been pouring across my new brew bench onto the freshly painted floor and under the handsomely pine-decorated walls. Mm. After grabbing the entire supply of bat- bath towels from the linen closet, I was able to soak up the water and restore everything the back, back the way it was, more or less. I even had a chuckle about the fiasco as I was finishing filling the kettle. Well, at least it was only water, I said aloud. I'm in foreshadowing number two. <laughs> With a bit of time to kill on my lunch break, I decided to address the lackluster Hefeweizen in a keg. I had missed my mash temp and it ended up with a tasty yet light and thin beer. Through experimentation and tasting the night before, I decided making this into a soured Berliner Weiss of sorts by adding 60 grams of citric acid to a five-gallon keg. Okay, yes, I knew that adding substances to the keg can be a dicey act, but I was prepared, so I thought. Andrew says, with a pull of the air relief and a burst of CO2, I removed the corny keg lid, but I failed to realize how much pressure was just released. I also failed to remember that I had cranked up the PSI to 50 (laughs) in order to burst carb the beer, and had inadvertently forgot to reduce the pressure. (laughs) Yeah. You've done something like that. The instant the citric acid solution hit the insanely overcarbonated beer, I was barraged with what would rival a pyroclastic cloud of Mount Etna. (laughs) In a state of shock, I watched dumbfounded as half a keg of beer erupted, filling the bottom of my fridge, spilling out across the entire floor up to my ankles. (laughs) Why didn't you quickly put the keg lid back, you might ask? I couldn't find the keg lid. In my moment of shock and terror, I dropped it into the tumultuous sea of wonderful-smelling beer foam. Uh, That wheat malt really does add to foam stability. (laughs) 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 These are the things you think, oh, wow, look at that. That's stable foam. (laughs) That's right. All over my shoes. Do you remember how I mentioned I used, used up the towels on the earlier water spill? Now I had an even bigger mess to clean and nothing absorbent to sop it up. Well, the good news is that I did not resort to cl- using my wife's curtains or other prized absorbent furnishings as I found a shop vac within a few minutes, but not before the beer could find its way under cabinets, shelvings, and walls. Mm. I think I'm going to be finding sticky beer and ants for the next year. So here I sit, contemplating life and my hobby choices with sticky feet, less than half a keg of experimental Berliner Weiss, a bruised ego, and a shop vac full of beer. <laughs> The funny thing is that part of me still wants to brew tonight. I mean, what else could possibly go wrong? <laughs> you know, it's amazing to me that in the in the face of all of this, <laughs> no one has said, 
I'm taking up mahjong. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. I'm just. I'm done. We're, we're all like, no, yeah. this is okay. Yeah. The the phone is stable. That's good. <laughs> I've I've learned. It smells great. <laughs> and and I'm I'm learning and I'm growing. How to turn your shop vac into a keyser. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Wes from Durham, North Carolina, says, first and foremost, thanks for all you do for the homebrewing community with your audio and video shows. It, it's really a heck of an achievement, and I know all the listeners and watchers appreciate it. Well, I appreciate that. Do the, th th thanks for reading some of the con comments. Not everybody appreciates it, but there he is. <laughs> uh, he says, uh, uh, he sent in two stories. Story number one, Kieser Kerfuffle, another Kieser. My future father-in-law is a woodworker, and for Christmas in 2020, he decided that he'd build me a cabinet to surround my chest freezer where I keep my kegs. And he sent a photo, and it's beautiful. Of course, I thanked him enthusiastically and looked forward to the result that I knew would take some time. Flash forward to May of 2021, and the cabinet is done. And let me tell you, when I saw it for the first time, I told him that free beer for life wouldn't be enough to repay him. It was nicer than I could ever ask for. Now I just had to hook it up. So that's his future father-in-law. I think he, he, he drew, drew well on, on the, in the cards of life. The cabinet was designed to surround the chest freezer with beer lines running to a tap tower on top, so I had to drill holes in the freezer somewhere. <laughs> oh. While I was well aware of the perils of drilling through anywhere but the lid of the fridge or freezer, I had to convince myself after some research that if I drilled through the side of the freezer, I'd be unlikely to hit any cooling lines. Foreshadowing. After drilling a couple of pilot holes without any issues, I slowly became convinced I'd make it through without issues. I took the hole saw to the freezer from the outside and made it through. Eureka! Now I just had to clean the hole by drilling through from the inside, and I'd be home free. I began to drill from the inside, thinking I was home free, and then hiss right through the cooling line. Um. <laughs> Having accidentally done the same thing to a dorm fridge years before. <laughs> and not learning anything, apparently. I knew the freezer was done for and I'd have to find a replacement. An afternoon of hunting and a couple hundred dollars later, I had a replacement freezer and the wisdom to drill through the top instead. That's why people make those collar things, you know, the wooden collar things oh, to yeah. put the lid on. Yeah. Story number two, flooded garage. Should we give Wes a second story? I, he deserves it. <laughs> flooded garage. <laughs> I fermented a stainless steel conical bucket and I purchased the temperature control kit for it. The kit works just like your wort chiller pond pump method. That's the low tech lagering system. Yes. Remember that? I do. Uh, cold water from an external cooler is pumped through a cooling coil that's mounted inside the lid of the fermenter where the temperature control unit triggers the pump in the cooler. So that's just like, I think they owe us the royalties. Is, absolutely. That's the low-tech lagering system. <laughs> <laughs> After using the rig a few times, I felt I had my routine down. Sure, I had to replenish the ice in the cooler once a day during the summer months, but at least I could ferment in my garage instead of in the bathroom that shares a wall with my fiancé's office. He says, she nor anyone enjoys the pounding of the bubbles in the blow-off jar at peak fermentation, especially during a work day. I don't know. I kind of find that soothing. Well. <laughs> <laughs> to each his own. Yeah. One day, I replenished the cooler with ice, put the pump line and the wastewater line back in the cooler, and went about my day. A couple hours later, later I noticed a puddle in the garage far from the fermenter and thought, oh, that's odd. I wonder where that could have come from. At this point, astute reader... You've probably realized what happened, what I happened upon about five minutes later. The wastewater line had fallen out of the cooler and was floating freely on the floor. The system had pumped all the water from the 10 gallon cooler onto the floor of my garage. A closet full of towels later. <laughs> See, this is another recurring theme. Always have a closet full of towels. Yes. And a brow full of sweat later, the garage was dry. Thankfully, everything in the garage was unharmed. You'd think I would have learned my lesson, right? Wrong. <laughs> Fast forward a couple of weeks and the exact same scenario played out again. Oh, my God. I've since been a bit more hesitant to use this system since I'm so prone to this particular brand of user error. I think I'll help myself out by drilling some holes through the lid of the cooler 
the lid of the cooler to secure the lines next time I use the setup. Thanks again for the great show. I especially enjoy the annual disaster shows. They're always educational while being highly entertaining. Hope you, Steve, and both of your families have an excellent and happy holiday season. Well, thanks, Wes. Yeah. I appreciate it. I think that was the third. I, I believe you're right. <laughs> you back me up on this one? I'll back you up on that one. Okay. Now we're out of beers from uh, <clears throat> Scott. Now we move to beers from uh, from Tom Brennan. <clears throat> now Tom was a customer of mine. Oh, very really? nice, very nice lad from from England. But he's local. But he's relocated to Northwest Arkansas. Well, he, I'm I'm not sure this is the same Tom Brennan. Get out! Because. I got a shipment of these. these. I got these by UPS or whatever. Oh, then, well, maybe there could be more than one Tom Brennan in the world. Surely there is. We'll sign up for Google alerts for Tom Brennan, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just a quick note, Tom Brennan is from New Jersey, and uh, not the local Tom Brennan that Steve knows personally here. Uh, do all Tom Brennans know how to brew delicious beers and meads? Probably. I'd say so. Hey, a reminder to uh, our Patreon subscribers, be sure to find the bonus video that I did for you all on making raw, unpasteurized, boozy eggnog. Man, that stuff is good. Uh, all the details, including a tasting by Steve on the video, uh, have been posted to Patreon subscribers at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. And many thanks uh, to all of you who are chipping in as our financial supporters. Patreon.com slash Basic Brewing. Now, uh, Tom sent a fruitcake barley wine. Oh, my gosh. Based on my recipe. Yeah. That's this one. Yeah. You want to open that one sure. while I'm talking? And he's also adopted your reused the, the, that, the Coors aluminum light. Coors yeah. Light. Yeah, let's see if we can get that open. <laughs> see why I passed that on to you. I can't get it open. <laughs> we might have to take a break. <laughs> so this is the uh, original gravity of 1074, final gravity of 1012 for an ABV of 8.2. Got any channel locks handy? <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> uh, this has got magnum, hops, cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, kvike yeast. And a pound, half a pound of cherries, pitted and cut in half, and then put in a mason jar with Dachshund Distillery Silver Rum. Ooh, he says local distillery. So if we if we Google Dachshund Distillery Silver Rum, maybe we can figure out where Tom is from. I'm gonna need a truss. <laughs> Let me. Get, I can't get. Give it me open. a shot. It's like the pressure has. Okay. <laughs> you got, we're going to take a break. Got two old guys, two old keezers here. <laughs> oh, it's moving. That's, That's what she said. Rough. That's what she said. <laughs> it's moving. I think the pressure <sighs> on that on that aluminum just forced it. <sighs> you, you loosened it up for me. Yeah, well, yes, I did. Oh, God. All right. Wow. Yay. <clears throat> need, a, need a lie down now. That was, yeah, that's right. That was worthy of an Olympic moment. <laughs> <laughs> the Olympic movement. <laughs> it's yeah. a movement. As Harry Shearer says, it's a movement. <laughs> and people need one every day. <laughs> <laughs> Have fun storming the castle. <laughs> Cheers, Tom. Here's the... Now, in mine, in my ver in mine version, I used uh, like candied uh, fruits, but he used a tincture of cherries. Mm. Mm. That's really good. That's a little bit of holidays right there. That is that is definitely that's got Bing Crosby written all over it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not going to go well, there. Well, I was thinking, of, you know, Bing Crosby singing those Christmas songs, you know, <laughs> White Christmas, <laughs> Rosemary Clooney. Oh, boo, 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 boo. <laughs> boo, boo, boo. Yes, it's very uh, bready. Wow, 
Mm. A little more delicate and subdued than your version. In other words, better. <laughs> no, not better. No, I would say it's better. But it's I like this it's quite very a bit. it's very quaffable. Yeah, it, there's a it it is a lot like uh, fruitcake in that there is a bready character. Mm -hmm. The cherries definitely come through. The spices definitely come through. Mine, mine, oh, my fruitcake barley wines, you know, they were always good like after a year. <laughs> well, <laughs> those spices had to, had to calm down a little bit. <laughs> and this is not hot at all, alcohol. What's the ABV on it? Yeah. 8.2. Yeah, it's warming. I can, mm. can feel the warmth. <sighs> oh, that's nice. Yeah, I can. I, I can like that quite a bit. Drink quite a bit of that. And, nice and nice probably job, well. Tom. Wow. I'll just keep this over here by me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we, it's a beautiful day. We're going to sit out here uh, for a long time after we get done here so that we'll be nice and safe. It's all about safe, being safe during the holidays. Uh, Ravian or Ravian from the Happy Brewery down in Australia. Uh what would you think that was? Is that Ravian or Ravian? I'm so blind, I can't see from that distance. Well, I you know I would probably say Ravian okay. because I always want to make things European, but he's Australian, <laughs> so I'm going to say it's it's Ravian, mate. Okay, mate. <laughs> I like that hat. Like that hat, mate. Okay. Um, hi, James. Ravian. Here from the beautiful Blue Mountains, just out of Sydney, Australia, with a disaster brew day for your collection. First off, thanks so much for the awesome content you've created over the years. Basic Brewing Radio is always one of the first podcasts I turn on when I'm working. So cheers. Well, cheers. Yeah. As well. <clears throat> okay, my brew day from hell doesn't involve any broken glass or human injuries, luckily. Just some damaged pride and equipment. First off, I buggered up the grain measurement <laughs> as I was looking at the pounds measurement instead of kilograms. <laughs> yeah. So managed to add half the amount of base malt that I needed. So my mash ended up at 1025 instead of 1046. I was thinking the grain amount seemed low as I was mashing in, but kept going anyway. <laughs> That's to your theory. <laughs> you just soldier on. Just, yeah. So when I took my post-boil gravity and realized it was so low, I thought, I'm making a blonde, so maybe I'll give it a bit of a Belgian spin and make some candy sugar. <laughs> As you do, on the spur of the moment. Well, sure. As I was bringing the sugar up to temp on my propane, my propane stove, suddenly flames began... Uh, we got fire! We got fire. I've been waiting for fire. Suddenly flames started erupting from the connection between the regulator and the stove. I cut the gas... <laughs> as one does, and disconnected everything quickly, with the only damage being some blackening of my gas regulator hose. With only 30 minutes left in the boil, I ran to my kitchen stove and continued to hurriedly heat the sugar. After everything, I could only hold the sugar at temperature for about 10 minutes or so before I had to rush back as I needed to add my 15-minute hop additions. My recipe called for Simcoe, but of course, as I checked my hops, no Simcoe. I substituted Columbus as one of as some of the spice in that hop may meld well with the candied sugar flavor. Fingers crossed. Okay, so everything should be fine, right? Wrong. Halfway through chilling the wort, the water outlet hose of my counterflow chitter, chiller must have gotten a kink in it. This is the second time that's oh, happened. Oh, yep. Because pop! The rubber sleeve of the chiller split and water went everywhere. Wow, the brew gods were <coughs> against me this time. Okay, so after turning off all water sources, I resorted to chilling the wort in two batches using an ice bath. So after all that, my gravity was still low, so I gave up and chucked in the remainder of a packet of light dry malt extract. See, that fixes everything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Always have DME. Always have DME handy. <laughs> well, with an original gravity of 1041, I was hoping it should still end up okay. Well, that sounds fine. Yeah. I'd pitched the wort over the tube of the beer I'd just packaged, so fermentation started quickly, and after five days, I'd hit my final gravity of 10.05, and the hydrometer sample tasted good, so hopefully it was all worth it. Now, you would think that this would be one of those disaster brew days where the batch would turn out amazing, right? Wrong. All of my gravity samples tasted fine, but due to life, 
I needed to leave the beer in the in the fermentation vessel for about four to five days longer than expected after I'd hit the final gravity, so I left it there and just cold crashed it for a day or so before kegging. Not even thinking I kegged the batch without doing a taste test. <laughs> so after everything was packaged, I took a sample and yep, as for everything else that happened during this brew, the batch was vinegar. Oh my. Well, sometimes you need to sacrifice a brew day, a gas regulator, a counterflow chiller, and a whole batch of beer to appease the gods. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Thanks, Robbie. I wasn't expecting the, a vinegar finish. No, neither was he. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, there you go. Well, I, I was expecting, I don't know, I was expecting... Um, now I can't even think of a flaw. I was I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't ex- diacetyl. Yeah, I'll take that. I'll take that for two hundred. <laughs> An album cover. <laughs> <laughs> Has it been three yet? No. <laughs> well, we got two more for it to be three. <laughs> it's because we moved on to the eight, to the eight point eight point three or whatever it is. <laughs> Woo. Mm. Oh, that's deep. So took, we've I, had I, we've had fire, we've had flood. Yes. We've had skull. We've had personal that's, injury. I'm waiting for broken glass and bleeding. Hmm. Yeah, we haven't had broken glass yet. Mm. We haven't had foreign object in beer. Nope. Nope. Not even Tipsy Brewer that they that they admit. Uh, see, I have a theory about this tipsy brewer. I think that <clears throat> I think that most brewing disasters are presaged by tipsy brewer. Because <laughs> that's just how it goes. I think you're right. Uh, Danny from Missenheimer, North Carolina. You know, I've been looking for him. <laughs> Heimer's been missing for a long time. John Jacob Missenheimer. <laughs> I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> this story is not an epic disaster, but it is full of irony. You, know, you got Alanis Morissette on the speed dial? I do. Say I knew her name right away. <laughs> That's ironic. It's a jagged little pill. <laughs> it's like rain on a wedding day. It was my first brew day. I used a three-gallon pot and a typical kitchen stovetop setup. I waited until my wife was gone for a couple of days. That's, that that is a, a lot of... That should be a, the, on the thing. Just in case I destroyed the kitchen. In this world, there are people who read and follow dis- instructions, and there are people who don't bother. I am one of those who reads directions carefully, and after all, it was my first brew day. I wanted to get it right. Well, good, yep. good for Danny. Uh, I was following each step ever so carefully. My big mistake, however, was that I was not looking at the next step. <laughs> when you do a recipe, you need to go through all this, read through all the steps. I heated the water, added the malt extract, stirred, and turned up the heat. Then the next instruction said, during the initial phase of the boil, watch the pot carefully for boil overs. At that very instance, I glanced over to the stove, only to see my pot in a massive boil over. Mm. The kitchen smelt like burnt malt extract, but I got that cleared before my wife returned. What I couldn't clean so easily was the scorched malt extract seared to the glass stove top. That was in June 1997, and I've brewed hundreds of batches since then. I moved to an outdoor propane burner in 2003, which got me out of the kitchen. So we started brewing at about the same time. Maybe yep. we, we were like maybe a year. A year, a year to year and a half. like that. Yeah. And you've, wow. you've also had uh, a ruined uh, glass stovetop due to a... Well, not ruined, but, um, but I definitely had a, a sticky situation. situation. <laughs> okay, now this is the third. Uh, Doug from Wilmington, North Carolina, 12-year listener. Wow. Wow. That's... <laughs> That See? was a little. That was a little. Christopher Walken. Wow, <laughs> wow, twelve years. That, that was nothing like Christopher. I apologize. No. <laughs> Twelve-year listener, first-time writer. I first started brewing after listening to your podcast. I love the learning and the humor. Wow, wow. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. 
That's more Vinny Barbarino. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Mr. Cotter. Mr. Cotter. <laughs> Up your nose with a rubber hose. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do Horshack. <laughs> uh, old people. Old people listen to the show. Yeah. Work absorbed my life for the past year and unable to brew for about a year. I planned a much needed brew day at the beginning of this year. I blocked out my day from work and started my first Hefeweizen. I'm starting the mash and I get a call that I need to provide data for a family estate house sale. It was a great offer, and so I needed to get data right away for the sale. Once again, being delayed with my brew day. So I turned off the propane and spent the next two to three hours getting answers to the real estate agent. Many back and forth. I tried to do both for a while, but felt pressure to prioritize the estate. First mistake. Brewing comes first. Brewing comes first. That's right. Anyway, three hours later, I get back to brewing only to realize I had not covered the kettle That was under two oak trees. Mm. (laughs) So I get back and see leaves in my wort, and the temperature was 190 degrees Fahrenheit and skipped all my mash steps. (laughs) So he's mashing. Oh, Lord. (laughs) After an internal scream, I decided to try to cool back to mash temperature, which takes one and a half hours to cool down. (laughs) For some reason, it never occurred to me to use my wort chiller. (laughs) The rest of the brew day was normal. The taste was off, but carry on. Opened the first bottle and poured a glass, and it was awful. I've heard many times to let bad beer sit because it may mellow over time. Planned to have four more tastings before I decide, but only could only get to three. <laughs> <laughs> I opened the bottle, and it flowed like lava. That's another recurring oh, Lord. thing. That was not... That was key to not even trying the third bottle. Complete dump out, and every bottle erupted. Again. Yeah. Good news from the terrible brew day. First, I retired, so I have more time. I got to take it not as a result of the brew day. <laughs> well, that, maybe. That's not, that's, not, that's not caused the correlation. I, brought an, I bought an electric system with temperature control and, and built a kegerator, and my beers have improved dramatically. Now I have better temperature control. Now that I have better temp control at both ends of beer making. Boy, congratulations to Doug for having better, better control at both ends. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, now you're retired. You've got time for that. <laughs> Thanks for doing the show. Cheers. You know, I would, I would say that... You would say. I would say that my brewing improved dramatically after I got my high-gravity... <laughs> Electric brewing system <laughs> from high gravity from brewing high gravity com. brewing in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> You're right, and actually, it really did. Yeah, I I was I found that consistently I could hit my marks better. You know, if I, by marks I mean temperatures, and and overall I felt like and and feel this way that my brewing my beer got better. Yeah, so there you yeah. go. There you go. Testimonial. Testimonial. True to life testimonial. And I have no dog in this hunt anymore. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. And they're good folks, too. Absolutely. As always, Steve is right. We love our Warthog Brew in a Bag systems from Desiree and Dave at HighGravityBrew.com. Steve has the 120-volt 5-gallon version, and I have the 240-volt 10-gallon version. Now, you've heard me mention it before in in the show in using it as a sous vide to sour my wort for my passion fruit beer. The system's extremely versatile. Uh, but now, you know, Steve and I have the Bayou Classic kettles with the basic basket where we use a bag. We're kind of old school. But you can upgrade your Warthog system on HighGravityBrew.com to a spike kettle with a brew kettle basket and ditch the bag altogether. In fact, if you want to go more traditional with a Warthog system with maybe two vessels or three from five gallons to two barrels, it's all in what you want. You can customize your your Warthog system at HighGravityBrew.com. My Warthog controller keeps my mash temps and boil strengths rock steady. I'm really spoiled. They've really taken the pain out of propane. 
And if you use the code EBC75BB, that's EBC75BB on HighGravityBrew.com, you can save 75 bucks off your Warthog electric system purchase. Start 2022 right! Desiree and Dave have been supporters of Basic Brewing since the very early days, and we're so lucky to have them as friends. Check them out at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. That's HighGravityBrew.com. Uh, now, this is the second brew, uh, uh, second beverage from Tom Brennan. This is the Fruitcake Honey Mead. Oh, nice. He said he split the yeast from the starter he made for the barley wine and started it on the same day. So this is... Uh, starting at 1090, finishing at 1012 for an ABV of 9.4%. 13 pounds of honey, Kirkland Orange Blossom, uh, Omega OYL0919. Uh, this is another Kvike. Oh, it's the same one. Yeah. Staggered yeast nutrient. A few days after the brew day, quote-unquote, I made a tincture of two teaspoons of whole cloves, two crushed nutmeg balls, and one... <laughs> we're, we're old, yet we're young. <laughs> and, and one whole cinnamon stick and three ounces of vodka. <laughs> he says he drank all the rum. The day I kegged the barley wine, put the mead in secondary with the cherries and let them sit for about a month. On kegging day, I added the tincture, leaving the spices behind. Ooh. So, what do you think? That's delicious. I love this. But I'm a mead guy. I love meads, and this is a really, really good. Oh, wow. Wow. I'm surprised that the gravity is so... It, or the finishing gravity is so high, you know. I am too. But but it doesn't taste unfinished, though. Oh. Mm. At 13 pounds. Did, did he say how big the batch was? I mean, I'm, um, I'm assuming it's a five-gallon batch. Oh, yum. I don't know. But, man, the flavor, you get this. You get the spices are kind of, they're not as, as up front as the previous. Right. In the, in the, in the barley wine. Right. But the cherries come through nicely. Yep. And the honey is wonderful. Yeah. Super honey forward. And very clean. It's very clean. It's just ever so slightly spritzy. Mmm. Oh. Yeah, I... That's a... Oh, that's, that's really good. I'd be really proud of that if I'd made that. So, congratulations. Yeah. I think... Mr. Brennan. Yeah. No offense to Scott. Uh... It's my it's uh, but but I think it's my favorite beverage of the of all six. Yeah, mine all, too. All those it was it was tough competition because Scott those uh, the lambics but they're but but it's all it's it's like comparing <laughs> apples and oranges. It is indeed. Those lambics were really nice and yeah. tart and drinkable and refreshing and everything that a sunny day out on the out on the on the porch uh, would. Uh, recommend but uh, but this is just I don't know maybe because I've had five five <laughs> previous <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right the last game of the season is always the best mm. that's super good boy that's really good wow thanks to Scott and Tom for sending those and thanks to everybody for sending in the stories we get who knows if we who knows if people can hear the drag racing over there at the <laughs> at the bypass and the hammer and they're building a, a neighborhood. I almost swore. <laughs> building a neighborhood next door. Uh, okay. All right. Will from Stockholm, Sweden. Dear old Stockholm. I finally have a brewing disaster worthy of submitting to your yearly disaster show. Now, having a disaster is not a goal, we should say. <laughs> That's right. Should not be a goal. <laughs> I finally achieved this. <laughs> I'm submitting this one since I've never heard anyone bring up the dangers of using gelatin in a basement. I well, want I want to have gelatin in my basement, but that's another. <laughs> uh, here's a, I mean the dangers. A little ointment of, will take care of if that. If you'd said the dangers of gelatin, period, I would say okay. That's I mean, 
you, you, there are dangers in using gelatin, but specifically dangers of gelatin in, in the, the basement. basement. Right. That adds a whole new complexity to it. That's very specific. It. Okay. Okay. One, he says, uh, Will says, once one Sunday evening last winter, I was in a hurry, but I thought I'd be able to add a gelatin finding quickly in my California common before I was supposed to put my son to bed. It usually takes five to ten minutes. It was 8.25 p.m., and my son's bedtime was 8.30. Fatal flaw. Time optimism. <laughs> time optimism. Step one. <laughs> Warm the water and the gelatin in the microwave. Check. Step two. Pour it into the beer that is cold crashing in the fermenter. Wait. I have the beer in my backup ferment fermentosaurus, and it's under pressure. Again, <laughs> with the pressure. No problem. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> Again with the pressure. Again with the pressure. No problem. I can use a carbonation cap, a plastic bottle, and a CO2 hose with quick connects to put the gelatin into the fermenter. Oh, man, this has taken more than five minutes. My wife calls to me wondering why I'm not putting our son to bed. I think to myself, I can still get this done and not be too late. And the sweat begins to drip down my forehead. <laughs> what do I need to do next? Ah, yes, pressurize the bottle. I grab the bottle with nearly boiling hot gelatin water solution in it mm. and start to go down into the basement. As I walked into the basement, I assure my wife that I will be there in a jiffy. I open the fermentation fridge, connect the hose to the bottle first, and then everything starts to go wrong. I notice that the hose is sliding off the barbs of the ball lock connector to the carbonation cap. My first instinct is to hold it on while I connect the other end of the hose to the fermenter. Ouch, that hurts. The liquid in the bottle is very hot and I begin to burn my hands. In my panic, I try to put the ball lock on the wrong connector. <laughs> Expletive, it can't hold. The heat of the liquid is too hot. I let go of the connector to the bottle and whoosh. The entire contents of the bottle spray out over everything. I have to admit defeat. As I walk back into the kitchen, my wife sees the exacerbation in my face. <laughs> Leave it alone. <laughs> I'm not going there. And then, and, then, and then I'm holding my hand. As I run cold water over my hand, I inform my wife of my failure, failure and ask her to very kindly if she could put her son to bed. Then I grab a rag, soap, a bucket of hot water, and return to the scene of the accident. To add insult to injury, upon returning to my fermenter and fridge, I realized that the gelatin water mixture had hardened, leaving a gelatin coating over everything. Yep. <laughs> Dejectedly, I fetch a dough scraper and a butter knife and begin hours of scraping all the surfaces. Oh, Lord. You can just add some marshmallows and pineapple to that and call it a fruit salad. <laughs> There's always room for jello. There's always room for jello. That's right. <laughs> On the bright side, it did not need to go to the hospital for burns. That's good. That's good. That's positive. And my five minute fining job only took four hours to clean. <laughs> Other than being hazy, the beer was tasty. <laughs> and surprisingly, my wife still loves me despite my time optimism. Lessons to be learned and then forgotten. Screw the hose ends to the ball lock connectors firmly and stop squeezing in brewing before bedtime. Oh, squeezing in brewing. <laughs> stop squeezing in brewing before bedtime. <laughs> Keep up the great podcast. I love the friendly voice from home. Well, thanks, Will. I appreciate that. Boy, that's a new one. The gelatin hardening on the yep. surfaces. The gelatin and the hardening on the surfaces and the lady. <laughs> and the lady. <laughs> and the heat with the hot. <laughs> and the hey. <laughs> uh, Jeff from Anchorage, Alaska. Do not always trust the internet when it sells you something called 550 cord. That yeah. little piece of advice. I was teaching a friend how to brew one day, so a couple of neighbors stopped by for some pints and a lesson in brewing an all-grain hazy IPA. We hit all of our numbers, completed our brew-in-a-bag mash, and I used lots of fancy words like 
sacrification and alpha amylase to wow the prospective new brewers. <laughs> so he's showing off. He's flying too close to the sun. That's right. Those wings are going to melt. The Icarus brew. I then employed a technique which I learned from your most excellent YouTube videos. I hung my brew bag with some new 550 cord from a 2x4 spanning between both sides of a ladder. 12 pounds of wet grain is less than 550 pounds, right? As I spun and squeezed the bag, <laughs> insert your joke here, <laughs> well, <laughs> the cord snapped and the brew bag dropped like a sumo wrestler into a hot tub. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> the 154-degree wart hit me like a tidal wave, yeah. and my neighbors gasped at my demonstration of master craftsmanship. <laughs> <laughs> Those wings melted, didn't they, Icarus? <laughs> Jeff says, somehow I was unharmed, just incredibly sticky and embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's happened to me. Boy, if I had a nickel for every time, that was sticky and embarrassed. <laughs> Reminds me of the eighth grade. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that was, that was the caption below my picture in the yearbook. Sticky and embarrassed? <laughs> Well, you did try to get a date with, the, with Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Mm. I returned from inside my house after 10 minutes with the wort just reaching boil. I instructed my friend, once your post-mass shower is done, <laughs> you could put on some fresh clothes and dry shoes, then add your bittering hop addition. <laughs> I like a transition just taking yeah, a stride. It just, that's all, all a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> the hazy was delicious. So there you go. The beer turned out well. That's a, that's a square on the thing, isn't it? Uh, he said, cheers, James. You're an inspiration to us all. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. <laughs> Sticky <laughs> and embarrassed. <laughs> now, Greg from Victoria, Australia. This is a this is a story for all times. Holy moly! Now it looks like Moby Dick over there. <clears throat> now I read this. I read this, and and uh, I, I, I and then I thought this is the best story ever. And then I re I recounted it to someone else, and they said he's making that up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't wait. So I don't know. Not <clears throat> impugning Greg from Victoria, Australia. I'm going to take a sip of this uh, uh mead. Oh, that's really good. All I'm saying is, at least from my vantage point, it appears to be a several hundred word essay. <laughs> Reader's Digest would have to edit this. <laughs> Something I would have graded a few years ago. <laughs> okay, here we go. Having listened to the 2020 Brewing Disasters show, I felt that my experience from last winter may be worthy of inclusion in this year's Hall of Shame. Hall of Shame. Hall of Shame. Hall of Shame. <laughs> <laughs> While working from home due to COVID, I developed a tendency to watch a lot more of the Facebook video content posted by well-known breweries, and a Sierra Nevada vertical tasting of Bigfoot got me thinking I should try and brew a version of it to brighten up a cold and wet winter. Well... You get ambitious when you do a vertical tasting of Bigfoot. That's true. My day didn't start well when I discovered the grain bill was much it was too much for the bucket I usually mill into. That should have set off some warning bells in my brain, but no. No. I then discovered a leaking silicone boot on the pump of my electric one-vessel system. With no spares, I resorted emptying out the mash water and liberally applying silicone sealant to the split. <laughs> well... <laughs> Don't yeah. go there. Leave it alone. Or not. <laughs> and, <laughs> and proceeded to heating and then adding the grain. As the mash vessel neared capacity, I lifted the inner malt tube up and slipped two stainless steel bars beneath the lip to hold the tube a bit higher so I could hold the last portion of grain. But my mash paddle that I'd used since beginning brewing 18 years ago found the grist too thick and promptly broke when I began stirring it. No big deal, I thought. The next problem occurred when I switched on the pump to recirculate the wort. The silicone tube on the end of the arm was virtually lying flat and was pumping hot wort over the edge and onto the shed floor. Ugh. Quick work with some bulldog clamps and cable ties managed to redirect the flow in a more productive direction. 
The match continued without further bad news until there was a big commotion outside my shed. Our two dogs had cornered a koala in the garden. <laughs> Which had just been freshened up with new plants by my wife. Her, but the koala her, had been freshened up? Or the, no, the garden. Or the garden. Okay. You can't refresh a koala. <laughs> well, you can, but uh, it's, a mess. it's a messy. It's very eucalyptus oriented. Suffice to say, two large dogs made a mess of the new plantings. The koala managed to escape to the safety of a large tree. Somehow this incident seemed to be my fault, so when the wort was safely up to the boil and the hot break over, it was my duty to drive to the nursery to buy replacement plants. I returned home some 20 minutes later to find that the wort had boiled over, leaving a sticky mess on the outside of the unit, and the <laughs> I hate it when the, there's a sticky mess on the outside of your unit, and the safety switch had tripped. I reset it and found the wort had cooled to 76 Celsius. It took quite a while to get back to the boil, adding even more time to an already long brew day. With the 90-minute boil once again underway, I settled down to watch the football on the TV in the shed, but I was interrupted when a large native parrot slammed into the window above the TV, <laughs> dropping to the ground outside. <laughs> it's a dead parrot. <laughs> He's only resting. He's only resting. Lovely plumage. <laughs> Our large German short-haired pointer... A great bird dog immediately grabbed the gala, about the size of a seagull, gently in its mouth and trotted into the shed, intent on presenting me with a gift as she knew she was in the bad books after the demolition of the garden. Not impressed with my loud rejection of the unconscious slash dead bird, the dog then paused by the kettle on her way out, looked back at me with a look that seemed to say, you know you really want, you really, you know you really do want this and promptly dropped the bird into the rolling wart. Yep. <laughs> uh, and then the... Of course. Okay, I'm going to take a guess here. The parrot's going to wake up. That parrot is not going to like that water, because it's only stunned. It's stunned. <laughs> it's, it's been nailed there. It's, it's, it's pining for the fjords. <laughs> <laughs> now, Greg says... Greg says, I raced to find a pair of barbecue tongs to retrieve the now definitely dead parrot from the kettle <laughs> and fling it out of the shed. I, <laughs> and then spent some time removing the downy feathers from the boil and, wonder, <laughs> oh God. and wondering what to do with the brew. Tip it or continue. I rationalized that the bird went in on the hot side. <laughs> <laughs> so the word should be okay. So I went to find a replacement spoon to create a whirlpool before I pumped into my fermenter. <laughs> my, my efforts with the shorter than usual spoon, <laughs> remember that from the first chapter, oh, yeah. saw me promptly dislodge the filter off the pump, and for only the second time in only 300 brews on my system, the pump clogged. I eventually got all of my wort into the fermenter and soon saw the reason for the trip switch. The heating element was a scorched black mess as a result of not having been scraped with my trusty paddle on a regular basis. It took a lot of soaking and elbow grease to eventually remove the thick black crust. I'd like to say that the beer ended up being spectacular, but it wasn't. I missed the original gravity by quite a bit and it tasted okay. But I won't be repeating it anytime soon. The shed floor and the kettle were a sticky mess that took ages to clean up. I had to remove and dismantle the pump, and I had to replace the silicone boots and the paddle. Domestic life has returned to normal as the new plants survived, and the dogs have now been barred from the shed on brew days. What happened to the parrot? <laughs> he, he was parboiled. <laughs> Parboiled and tossed away. Now, I my contention is that there are way too many details in this story to be at least it's, completely fictitious. Um, I think it happened. I, I don't think it's. I don't think it's made up at all. I mean, I think it's well written. Yeah, it's well written. It, there are just too many details in there. Yeah. To to I mean the step by step and the uh, either. Either Greg is uh, is a a a talented fiction writer, 
where that happened. I think it happened because if this had been in Arkansas, <laughs> the dogs would have cornered a raccoon. <laughs> right. <laughs> or a possum. Or a possum. <laughs> and... <laughs> And I can see that happening. Right. That could easily happen. Yeah. So it's Australia, you corner a koala. <laughs> as you do. As you as one does. <laughs> and then a <laughs> parrot flying in and into and the window. Into the window. That could be that and could then your be your bird dog brings the thing and drops yeah. it in the kettle. That's perfectly, perfectly understandable to me. Plausible. Li- pl- yes. <laughs> uh, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> Living in a semi rural area as we do, that could that could easily happen. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I'm surprised about is that he said he would never brew that again. Because, <laughs> well, it'd be hard to recreate that. There there are beers, uh, historic beers, that uh, that put uh, male chickens into, That's the, right. into the beers. Yeah. I'm too polite right now to say what the names of those beers are. Me too. Male chicken beers. Yes. Not, not roosters. Charlie Papazian's book had a recipe for that. For the <laughs> the joy of the joy of home brewing. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. All right, we got a table full of empties. Well, they're and, not quite uh, empty. Well, I'm going to have a little bit more of this mead. Yeah. Be careful. Just All right. To touch. That's um, that's it. That's, that was that's 2021. That was inspiring. Glad, glad to see the end of uh, you, 2021. Oh boy, no, no kidding. I'm looking forward to 2022. Here's to here's to your good health. Thank you. You're looking chipper. I'm feeling chipper. I feel chipper, really chipper. <laughs> we get to see our boy Drew tomorrow. That's uh, not for we the get first to see time our... for the first time in two years. Oh my gosh! Well, yep, you beat since me before get, the pandemic. We get to so. see Chase in about a week for the first time in about a year and a half. Actually, wow. no, 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 no. I take that back. We, he he came home about four months ago. So. I well, take that back. Well, but either way, either way, here's to good friends. Tonight is kind of special. The bi- no, that's <laughs> <laughs> here's to here's to friends and family, and uh, to all, everybody out there who listens to the show all the time, no matter how goofy and you know, <laughs> no matter how many dad jokes, <laughs> a little ridiculous it gets. <laughs> but uh, hopefully. 2022 will mean uh, better times, better health, better beers. For everyone. For everyone. God bless us, everyone. everyone. (laughs) I beat you to it. (laughs) And Tiny Tim did not die. (laughs) Hi there, spirit. Do you walk to school or carry your chain? (laughs) No one will get that except me. All right, everybody. Thanks for hanging with us for another... God, I don't even know. This is the longest one ever. That's not what she said, but (laughs) this is the longest disaster show ever, I think. 18 schnitzel group is my limit, baby. (laughs) (laughs) That's my obscure joke. Okay. I'm tired. Tired of being in my... (laughs) All right. Uh, Let's go before the battery does. All Cheers, right. Steve. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks for hanging out. That's it. Thanks again to Scott Housel and Tom Brennan for the show beverages. Thanks, of course, to Steve for his continued friendship and contributions to this ongoing weird obsession. <laughs> Thanks to our sponsors, the American Homebrewers Association, HighGravityBrew.com, Imperial Organic Yeast, and Groenfell and Havoc Meaderies. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to our Patreon uh, supporters. And, of course, thanks to everybody else who tunes in every week and has done so since July of 2005. Uh, (laughs) All the best for a disaster-free 2022, everybody. And if you do have a disastrous brew day, think of us. No, wait. I I (laughs) don't think of us immediately. But, you know, (laughs) maybe I shouldn't say that. (laughs) (laughs) That's not a good catchphrase (laughs) at all. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com. Just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. And thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way, including that eggnog video that I talked about earlier. 
Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dots. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. Happy New Year, everybody. So long. Thank you.